And so I can see that this one added just under 11 milliliters. So it was just about 11 milliliters, uh, and that was slightly too much. How this is helpful is for my next three trials, what I'm going to do, and this will make things move faster, is I know I can add very quickly nine milliliters, I would say, in this particular case. Um, and then I know that for that last milliliter, or milliliter and a half, I would guess, I need to go more slowly. So I'm going to put this one aside so that we have something to compare to, and I'm going to prep my next sample uh, to get ready for my next three trials uh, of this titration. All right, so I'm all set up to do my first good titration. It's my second trial. This should be my first good one, I hope. Um, in prepping my sample, again, I pipetted 10 milliliters of my desired sample, in this case KHP, and I put in about four drops of phenolphthalein indicator. If you don't have the indicator, you're not going to get the color change. Okay? Now, what's great about titrations is that my final volume from my previous trial is now my initial volume of my new trial. So you can just transfer that number right into trial two. Initial burette reading in milliliters will be 14.00. Now, quickly doing some math in my head, I know I can add about nine milliliters very quickly, which brings me to, if my math is correct, 23 milliliters. I'll just turn that so I can see it. So I know that basically I can just open this stopcock and let it run to 23 milliliters. I'm not even swirling right now. You might choose to. But you can see when I stop and swirl, everything goes away. I'm not quite at 23 yet. There we go. Okay. So this is where titrations for you guys become uh, about a three-person job. The first person's job, they're going to be prepping the sample. So they're going to be in charge of pipetting 10 milliliters of, of sample into the Erlenmeyer and adding those drops of indicator. Second person's job is going to be opening and closing the stopcock on the burette here. And you want to get really good um, and practice with that so that you can add drop by drop. The third person is going to be the swirler, and when you swirl, you want to make sure that every drop that's delivered from this burette gets into the solution um, in the Erlenmeyer. The reason for that being the reading on the burette tells you that that volume has been delivered, but if you've got drops hanging out on the glass here, that volume hasn't actually been delivered into your sample. Okay, so we've got person one prepping the sample. All right, good. Person two. And three, you're going to be doing um, you're going to be doing the titration itself. Okay, uh, you both want to be looking at the color of this solution. Again, person three is the swirler. Person two is operating the stopcock here. Now, because I've done approximately 17 million titrations, I'm going to do this on my own. Okay, and you'll notice how I don't actually even really care what the reading on the burette is until I'm done. So I'm just really focused on opening up this stopcock here. Do, do, do. Any time now. So that I can add drop by drop. And so you see where drop by drop, other person slash my left hand is going to be swirling. Okay, you can kind of notice how much longer it's taking. So I can slow down that drop by drop delivery. And guys, here's where it's really important. Again, let's remember this guy. That was our fast titration. That's way, way too dark. In our, um, in our good trials, it will be the difference of one drop to take this solution from colorless to pink. And I'm going to tell you, it will not be this pink. Okay, it'll be a really, really pale pink. That's why I have this white tile here, so that I'm able to see that color change more readily. So I'm just going to move this one out of my way so that it's not kind of skewing what I'm seeing. And again, just really making sure that I add 
do my best to add a drop at a time. Sometimes, excuse this, sometimes we get a drop hanging off the end of the burette, uh, so you just got to make sure that you flick it in. Okay, I'm. this is really close, I can tell here, so I want to make sure I'm really careful about adding a drop at a time. Is this it? Is this it? Yes, it is. Okay, so I swirl, swirl, swirled, and I have the faintest pink, and that was the difference of a drop. Okay, the drop before, colorless. This drop, pink. So again, I'm going to put these two guys side by side so you can compare. Fast trial, probably not going to fall within that acceptable range. Good trial. Okay, very, very different shades of pink here. All right, let me take this volume reading for you. 24.2, it's just over 0.2, so 24.22, I'm going to call that, 24.22. Jot that down. That is our final volume of trial two and also our initial volume of uh, trial three. All right, guys, so here is my fourth and final trial, and I'll tell you the volumes uh, for the third and fourth trials. So initial burette reading for that third trial, we already know it's the same as the final burette reading for the second trial, 24.22. The final burette reading on that third trial was 34.55, and the final burette reading on the fourth trial was 44.78 milliliters. I've done the math, I've determined the volume delivered for each of those titrations, and I know that I have three good trials. So again, what is good, it means it falls within that, or all three trials fall within that acceptable range of 0 0.2 milliliters from least volume delivered to most volume delivered. So what would I do if on my fourth and final trial, or what I thought would be my final trial, I got a volume that fell outside of that range, well, then I would simply do a fifth trial, or sixth, or seventh. I think I've seen one group of students go as much as eight. If you're going that far, you're probably not being careful enough with, uh, with your titration process, and that could go anywhere from um, the sample, and making sure you're delivering exactly 10 milliliters of that. Uh, that could be you're not paying close enough attention to uh, the volume readings, you're not making those accurately enough, or it could simply be that you're uh, operating uh, the burette isn't, uh, you're not concentrating enough on, on doing a good job of that. So if you get to that fourth trial, you look at the volume delivered, uh, you don't have three values that fall within that acceptable range, then you need to do a fifth trial, okay? If that one is still outside of the acceptable range, then you need to do a sixth trial. I really hope we don't get there. Uh, we have, you know, limited amount of titrant for everybody to use, um, but just so you know, it's not the end of the world. You can do more trials. The last thing I want to talk to you guys about is how clean all your glassware needs to be. So it all needs to be analytically clean. Remember, that means we've rinsed with distilled water. It also needs to be dry. When we're analyzing solutions, remember, adding volume to a solution, volume of water, um, dilutes the sol solution. So if I used, um, for example, these Erlenmeyers here, if I use them and they still were wet and still had distilled water left behind in them, I'm actually diluting the concentration of my sample. And so that's not going to help me out in this process. Really important, everything is both clean and dry. Okay, let's move away from talking about the physical process of actually doing a titration and take a look at what the mathematical process behind determining these concentrations with our titration data would look like. This is what your data table should look like. Um, 
everything set up, uh, all the numbers entered correctly, and then figuring out the volume delivered. This should be done while you're doing the titration, certainly before you clean things up, because you need to know that you do have, in fact, three good trials. Now, when we have three good trials, this doesn't mean we're doing the titration calculation three times. We're simply using the average of those three volumes in our math for the titration. So in looking at this table, what we need to ask ourselves is, what are we talking about here? It's one thing if we're getting this data from actually having done a titration. It's another if this was a homework problem or a question on a test or quiz and we were just presented this table and we had to go from there. Very difficult. First thing you need to ask yourself is, what is my sample? What is my titrant? And why do we need to know that? Because the values that you have in this table refer to the volume of titrant delivered, not the volume of our sample. So we need to make sure that we're correctly identifying what was our titrant, what was our sample. Again, very easy if you've actually done the lab. You know, well, I put sodium hydroxide into that burette. That was my titrant, obviously. Okay. If this was a question on a test where you hadn't done the lab, there is still a way to know, and it's all in the title of the titration table. Every titration table has the exact same setup for a title, which, by the way, means your titration tables in your titrations you're going to do in this class will also have the same setup for the title. So please make sure you take note of that. In the title, it says titration of, and this particular example, it's 10.00 mils of 0 0.150 molar KHP with NaOH. Every single titration table is titration of substance A with substance B. And that's very helpful for us because it allows us to know what was our sample what was our titrant? Guys, here's the key. The substance that is mentioned after the word of, so titration of substance A, that is always your sample. So if this was on a test and you didn't just watch me do this, you would know that the sample was KHP because that's the chemical substance that is mentioned after the word of. The substance mentioned after the word with, so with substance B, in our case NaOH, that is your titrant. Okay, so the general format for um, titles for titration tables in labs or on test questions is titration of sample with titrant. And then any known concentration or volume uh, amounts we always put in there. So that's why I have some numbers in there, 10.00 uh, mils and 0.15 molar. Um, we always include anything that we particularly know. So your job right now, guys, is to figure out the concentration of this NaOH solution. And that, friends, is the concentration you're going to be using for your next couple of um, titrations. Okay, so you do need this value and you need for it to be correct in order to do your next couple of labs. I hope that this has been helpful for you. Um, please feel free to watch, re-watch, share with your friends, discuss amongst yourselves, and ask me any questions if you are unsure about either the process or the math in doing a titration. Thanks, guys.